live. Great, and welcome to another edition of Machine Medicine's interview, where we uh, talk about uh, neuromodulation and all things brainy. Um, this week, we are honored to have uh, a professor, Stephen Silverstein, uh, of uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, University, um, where he has a chair, and also uh, is uh, director of the Headache uh, Center. So thanks very much for, for being with us, Stephen. And, and perhaps you'd kick off by giving us a, a short bio, a little introduction to, to you and, and your work, and, and, and super interestingly, how you got into this area. Well, um, like many people from my generation, we had a career plan for all of us. We were supposed to do our medical internship and a year of medical residency, go to the NIH, learn basic research, come back and do a neurology residency, and then become a basic researcher in neurology. When I was at the NIH, it was a great place. The, one of the people I worked for won the Nobel Prize, Julius Axelrod. But my wife used to tell me that I would come home the one night a week I worked in a free clinic taking care of a patient happier than the rest of the time. <laughs> so I decided that my role was in clinical medicine and making it better. And then eventually I got particularly interested in headache medicine and mm -hmm. part again because of my wife. And then I eventually devoted my entire career to headache medicine, brought in associates, moved from a private practice about 25 years ago to an academic practice where mm -hmm. now we have about 30 employees. We have nine neurologists, four psychiatrists, psychologists, nurse practitioners, nurses, and four headache fellows. Wow. So it's a big, it's a big center, uh, one it's of the largest in the US, right? It includes an outpatient infusion unit, and also we have an inpatient unit, which can take up to 20 some patients. Interesting, cool. And it'll be just um, interesting to sort of tarry for a moment on the topic of headaches, because I remember in, in my own clinical days, working on the, the headache firm and finding it um, kind of quite bewildering, the sort of this, this kind of sheer menagerie of different forms that headaches takes because of course we say headache but there's all sorts of of different subtypes right and i'm, I'm very probably very different underlying mechanisms so, so please do correct me if i'm wrong um uh so it, it's it, and it's something i think that also the the, the general uh say a, a family physician or or even a general medic um often feels fairly out of their depth uh managing uh, with all kinds of sort of uh, uh traps and uh and, and uh for the unwary such as uh, you can get a headache from taking analgesics, right? So, so this is a, it's, 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 it's how, how big a problem is it and how, and how complex a field? Well, we need to look at it. If, if you got a cold or the flu, you're going to get a headache as a side effect, mm. a secondary headache. But if you have an event where you have head pain that throb, and you feel sick to your stomach, the overwhelming odds are it's migraine. Yeah. You have a relative with migraine that you don't want to move around with a headache. And it's really, if you think about it, a headache that keeps you from doing things. Is, mm. More often than not, it's migraine and a low-grade mild headache. More often than not, it's tension headache. And most of the other headache types are either secondary to another medical illness or very mm. rare. So it's not that hard to diagnose migraine if you just say it's a disabling headache and light mm. bothers you or you're sick to your stomach and as opposed to trying to get every single piece of the puzzle together and one of my friends did a study in gp's office and they found out that 90 percent of the patients who come with a headache complaint do in fact have migraine really okay yeah you think about it um 12 percent of the population in the united states has a migraine mm, i see so if you guess migraine you're going to do pretty well. Yeah, if somebody complains about it, they're walking to your office, it's been there for a while, it's more likely than not to be migraine. Okay, cool. So, and, and then your particular interest is in um, sort of neuromodulatory approaches as a therapeutic approaches. And so how did how did anyone sort of start to, to sort of well, get started with this sort of field? What, was there a basic insight, a piece of animal uh, uh, experimental work that gave us the, the crucial clue or, or, and in particular, vagal nerve stimulation, I believe? Um, well, actually, if we go back 2,000 mm -hmm. years, one of the uh, physicians for the Roman Caesars, he took a live torpedo, put it on the head, shocked the head, 
to make headaches go away. So neuromodulation has been around for a long time. And with the development of electricity, there's electroshock therapy, and eventually it led to an interesting observation. Mm. There are patients who had intractable epilepsy, who had an implanted vagal nerve stimulator. Mm. And those patients who had it, their headaches got better. There are also people, quote unquote, with occipital neuralgia, they had implants and their migraine headaches got better. So it began that way and it led to the development of non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation, which stimulates the vagus nerve, mm. led to the device that fits right here, the cephalic device, which stimulates like a TENS unit, the nerves. Mm. It led to the development of auricular vagal nerve stimulator, to the ceramic device, which mm. fits on the arm and stimulates that. There's also another device which just came back, which actually is a magnetic uh, stimulator that stimulates the nerves of the brain. And there is also a senopalatine ganglion stimulator, which I believe has just come back for the treatment of cluster headache. So there's a lot of different approaches for neuromodulation. Mm. All are different, but what you're really doing is changing the behavior of the brain and the pain pathways. Yeah, I see. So it was a real story of sort of ser a, a, a careful clinical observation. Yes. Ser serendipity, uh, realizing that these, that these patients were benefiting in unexpected ways. And then the kind of the approaches seem to have, from your description at least, sort of burgeoned out and, and incrementally developed um, from that. Um, and and is, is there, a, as you said, you sort of the unifying principle is, is this idea that we are um, modifying the behavior of, of neuronal populations and, and ultimately the circuits that must underlie yes. the active sensation of, of pain. Um, and, um, and it seems that in, you know, if we look at an example like uh, deep brain sti stimulation in Parkinson's disease, one can, one can somewhat intuitively grasp the idea that say, if a tremor is being driven by a, a set of oscillations in the basal ganglia and, and perhaps elsewhere as well, um, then uh, that you could somehow destructively interfere with that activity and it, it might give a therapeutic benefit to say a tremor that seems to be quite intuitive it's much harder to get an intuitive grasp of of why this should work for for pain right. let and me give you an example have you ever stubbed your toe yeah sure and then massage your leg or something like that yeah 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 I that guess is you called conditioned pain mm. modulation mm. information from the other side goes up into the brainstem, turns off the descending pain control system, I makes see. pain in your leg. Now, one of the tricks I've learned is when I go to a dentist where I find it very uncomfortable, I take my nail and put it against the finger, create a semi-painful stimulus, and I don't feel what the dentist is doing. Really? Not. That's called mm -hmm. conditioned pain modulation. The cool. second principle is the TENS unit. You, have, uh, you stimulate with a low frequency mm -hmm. in the same area of the pain, and by the principle that pain inhibits pain at the same spinal cord or brain stem level, mm. uh, it turns the pain off locally. Mm. Vagal nerve stimulation is a different principle. Information goes into the brain. The vagus is quieting parasympathetic, and that sets off a whole chain reaction of pain relieving things. So we so have just just by up, up, uh, uh, just by sort of as it were um, upgrading the the sort of tonic level of the parasympathetic parasympathetic Correct. nervous system, you, you mean pushing the whole pushing the whole system yeah. to sort of rest and relax. Yeah. And in addition, what we've discovered is the vagus system, when activated, is anti-inflammatory. Interesting observation: if you have a spleen in an animal and you inject it with an antitoxin, they'll mm. survive. You take the spleen out they'll die. Mm. If you cut the vagus nerve, they'll die because the vagus nerve makes the spleen create something that fights toxins. Mm. We now know that in addition to the vagus nerve being anti-pain, it's anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So and the vagus nerve seems to have a special place in this story. And, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, 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 a from a, from a purely anatomical level, a, a highly sort of 
convolved and, and intricate structure with many different sort of uh, many different nerve bundles, right? And it, and it, I think its name even derives from the, uh, the wandering, wandering nerve, but wandering nerve, it right? It wanders; it knows where it's going. Yeah, you stimulate the vagus nerve. You're stimulating the part that goes into the brain. Mm. Therefore, you don't have all the parasympathetic stuff with the slowing of the heart or anything. Right. And yeah. what that tells the brain is this information is telling us we got to stop some pain. Mm. I see. And then let, let me let me push you a bit further on that, and then ask. Well, we, we might. I, I think I mentioned the, the phenomenon of um, analgesic headache uh, at the beginning. So, is there an equivalent neuromodulatory version of analgesic headache where you can actually okay. hear? Here's the here's headache. the point you're talking about. There's something called analgesic induced. Or medication overuse headache yeah and that is due to the fact that certain drugs or medicines if you take too much of as mm. they wear off the headache comes back it's drug induced or medication right. you mean, headache. So, so it's not the analgesic it's the fact you've taken so much i see you become used to it and you need to keep taking it the interesting start about neuromodulation yeah doesn't do the same thing yeah, if you use neuromodulation. The more you use it, it acts as prevention. It mm. keeps the headaches from occurring. It doesn't produce um, adaptation. Withdrawal headache. So, do, you, do you have a sort of adaptation response? I, I mean, presumably at some level, it must be. Is there pl plastic changes or something that? But we don't see it clinically. Is that okay. right? We know, for example, from some of the basic science work. Mm. that if you have electrical stimulation, it changes the neurochemicals inside of the brain. Yeah. And act, if you give it repeatedly, it can act quite the entire system down. Mm. Yeah. Um, but can you, I guess if we can give it, if you give it repeatedly, could you then not upregulate the entire system? And then it will come back to my question. Is it, is it possible to induce a headache with, with this? Has that, has that are there even case studies of that? Is that? If you give a painful stimulus yeah. anywhere in your body, it can induce headache because pain induces pain. But the mm -hmm. treatments we give are not painful or minimally annoying. And therefore, the secret is the following. If you grind the, turn the pain level up just a tiny bit, mm -hmm. it's any pain. If you turn it up more and more, it becomes pro-pain. I didn't mean propane gas, but four pounds. Yeah, and I know. The I know. concept is that if you give very low levels of input, you get the type of nerves that are needed that turn the pain off. These are the small fibers? The issue is the following. In terms of the concept of local control with the TENS unit. Okay, now what do I do? That your badger pitch. Okay, simplest way of looking at it. If you have a TENS unit here, the mm -hmm. TENS unit stimulates the big fibers, the C uh, whereas the pain is the small C fibers. Yeah. They both go into the same area, the spinal cord or the sure. spinal or the or the brain stem. Mm -hmm. And the A delta fibers turn off the C fibers. And that's mm -hmm. that's the gate theory of pain. Yeah. Is that something that you, you still sort of uh, use in your sort of uh, as part of your sort of scientific and clinical as a tool for understanding this? It's, it, it's a simple minded way of looking at the difference between 10 stimulation, which is at the same level, whether right. it's gate control or intermediaries. It's a local phenomena. In contrast, yeah. when you put the Theranica device on your arm, it's not the same spinal cord level. Those signals go up into the brainstem mm. and activate the descending pain control system. Yeah. So a bigger system, it goes up and it goes down. And vagal nerve stimulation is entirely different. Stimulating the vagus nerve activates an entire network of pain control fibers. So going from TENS, which is local, to condition pain modulation was a little bit less local, to vagal nerve stimulation, which is everywhere. Mm. The uh, stimulating the back of the cortex with the magnet 
that basically works on stopping something called um, a process where an electrical activity moves across the brain, which is responsible for the organ of some people, the headache pain of migraine, and it's called cortical spreading depression. Yeah. And by blocking that, many people believe this electrical impulse works to help control migraine. Mm. So, so this is all, they're all electrochemical mechanisms, but they're different ones, but they all do the same thing. Yeah, so so this is the phenomenon responsible for the aura and it, and it turns typically it turns out that you can yes. terminate the whole yeah. migraine if you if yeah. you can terminate the aura. Yeah. So, and the same thing may also happen when somebody has a concussion and we now know that there's a process in the brain hmm. that cleans out um, trash, the trash removal system. It's called the glymphatic system. Yeah. We now know if the glymphatic system is impaired, that people get foggy brain and have trouble thinking. And we know that cortical spreading depression can turn off the glymphatic system. Maybe that's why people get brain fog after a migraine. And if you get banged in the head, you can have cortical spreading depression and again produce brain fog. Mm. And people have actually now looked at drugs that uh, open up the lymphatic system to neutralize that. Mm. So it's all sort of coming together. Everything from what sleep does to make you feel better to how migraine interferes with sleep to mm. that. So I tend to look at the lymphatic system as the toilet of the brain. And basically when you have a migraine headache, your toilet's stuffed up. Hmm. I see. It's a nice way of thinking about it. So, so it's very interesting um, to hear you talk about uh, the sort of some of the mechanisms that are at least putative um, uh, underlying the therapeutic effect. One of the one of the issues in other areas of neuromodulation, as you'll be no no doubt be aware, is uh, the issue of programming. So post post deployment. Um, so how how much do uh, how much can and does vagal stimulation need to be tuned to a particular patient or is it basically a kind of one size fits all? If you look at invasive uh, stimulation, mm -hmm. like occipital nerve stimulation, yeah. that has to be fine tuned for the patient. Um, cephali, you have the ability to increase the volume up and down on a personal mm -hmm. level. Same with the vagus nerve stimulation. Same with the cephalic, same with the ceramic device. Mm. But many of the devices have a what I would call a volume control, frequency mm. and duration, everything of the impulse is fixed. But you can turn because skin resistance in, is different in people, and the same volume may produce more input. So you can all adjust it on an individual basis, but the shape of the waveform and the duration are fixed. Mm. Is that a sufficient level of control, do you think, for a sort of optimal uh, tuning of these devices? To the best of my knowledge, and I'm not an electrophysiologist, all of these waveforms have been tested and checked in animal models hmm. so that they got the optimal form. That's, right. That's what we know. And um, we also know that by modifying the waveform, you can actually do the opposite and prevent it from working. I've learned a lot about it. I used to think that a slow up and a slow down would be better. Mm. But the people who are basic in the physics that sharp up, sharp down, because you don't you need a certain level of activity. And also, if you're a electro neurophysiologist, you know, the best waveform to get an impulse and specifically to stimulate the nurse types that you want. So yeah. my point of view, uh, my bias is that the people who've invented these devices have found that the only thing you need to do is adjust the intensity, not the waveform. Now, when the time you inject, change the waveform, either if you're doing a clinical trial, you adjust the waveform to a point where it's really, you can feel it, but it doesn't do anything positive for you. Right. But I'm pretty impressed with that. I think with the invasive drive devices, it's a different animal. Mm. Because you're, you're actually in tissue and the surrounds of the electrodes are probably as important and not as stable as applying an, an external device. So you, you mean it's much more kind of dynamic uh, 
and you, so you need to adapt as sort of things yeah. shift and, and yeah. change. Yeah, I, I believe that's that's been my practical experience with doing both invasive and non-invasive devices. Mm. That the invasive devices, because they're in an atmosphere of moisture and tissue, mm. they need to be individually adjusted. Very interesting, isn't it? Because you know, for all that that may be the practical experience, it's yeah. You know, one wonders why why at bottom the, the principles are. Are not the same but, but well perhaps. i think the principles are the same the difference is all the other devices you have a standard skin and you have the chemical and electrical properties through which you're stimulating but when you put a needle into somebody you have lots of different mm -hmm. other electrochemical elements that have to be compensated that can be varied from which way the, the needle goes Right, I see. So you're saying when it when it's non-invasive, because you've you've basically got a, a highly standard uh, setup, as it were. And as soon as, you, as soon as you insert an electrode, and yeah. all, well, what's the electrolyte concentration? What's yeah. the, the actual yeah. how millimeters matter in terms yeah. of yeah. proximity to yeah. n nerves and stuff? Yeah. So um, yeah, that's so basically you can yeah you can sort of take a one size fits all approach for non-invasive rule of thumb. And, but you need a highly adapted. So then, what? Then you know, there does seem to be a bit of there does seem to be a bit of a, a sort of a revolution in the field in the sense that well, maybe, I mean, let me use the example of the neuromodulation journal, the main journal of of the the, the, the sort of field used to only cater for uh, invasive uh, neuromodulation, as I understand it, and only uh, you know several years ago or, or maybe a decade ago, I don't know what the date was, but but then. Uh, sort of realized that or, 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 or recognized that that actually non-invasive neuromodulation was turning out to be at least as big a deal and, and maybe ultimately a, a much bigger deal in terms of its uh, you know its, its ultimate utility because it can be deployed with things like 510k rather than you know pre-market approval and so forth um, so uh, yeah it does it does seem that there's, there's that neuro non-invasive neuromodulation seems to is, is it become do you think it's is this going to become the definitive kind of paradigm, do you think, or will there always be a place? I think it's going to be both. Yeah. Um, I, I think that there are times you're going to need small focal stimulators in and around the nerve. Uh, for example, phantom limb syndrome. The best way to probably treat that would be to get a something on the nerve that can be specifically stimulated at a certain frequency to turn off the phantom limb. Right. So right. I, I think that in contrast, one thing I did not mention is another paradigm is another company called Thermoquil, which has figured out that by heating and then cooling areas of the skin, you can produce a nerve block mm. and temperatures much lower than are painful. And that's a new mechanism. It's basically it's topical and it's programmed, but it's the idea is that you can cool and heat the nerve all yeah. the day and you can then quiet it down without being painful and mm. without and and without high temperature and low temperature so that's another basic mechanism and this is based on complex electrophysiology yeah heating and cooling nerves and uh animal models to find out what the best way to do it is yeah i mean that's really striking actually isn't it um I, i'm not sure if there's a, there's, a, there's a, another company i know about maybe may the same one but they're doing a uh, caloric stimulation of the uh, uh, vestibular stimulation uh, right. for, yeah. for migrants. Yeah, there's a couple companies that are doing that. Uh, there's companies that are actually doing vibration in the ear. Mm. A company that's doing, uh, so a lot of it's still proprietary and I cannot talk about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. But there's a lot of companies that are actually looking to the ear as an entry into the trigeminal and vestibular system. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's very, it's very interesting how the kind of these different different forms of neuromodulation, so magnetic, electrical, caloric, you know, vibratory. Um, uh, actually, it's turning out that actually that maybe we'll end up with some kind of hybrid of all of these things, or, or some potential uh, hybrid whereby we're. I think you hit the nail on the head. Since a lot of these are different mechanisms, mm. really no reason why different types of devices can't be synergistic. And yeah. some of my patients who have more than one device will say that they use them both and they get a better result. Really? Yeah, for the same, for, yeah, so do I have 
caloric and uh, electrical uh, right. or something. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And uh, uh, and so, would you see? Would you see then? Uh, do you say this? You think there's probably a role for both invasive and non-invasive? Do you see this? You know, the the argument I've heard is actually well, non-invasive is going to be much more impactful for really quite pragmatic reasons. It's because of things like you know, getting five ten k approval for a, a non-invasive device is much more straightforward uh, than getting invasive uh, approval, uh, get it, uh, pre-market approval for an invasive device. And therefore, you know, if we're thinking about the real, the, the real sort of uh, 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 crises in terms of disease burden, like obesity, depression, OCD, then non-invasive is really as, as much more potential yeah. to... Vagal nerve stimulation has been approved for depression. And then the next concept might be non-invasive. One of the yeah. problems with invasive devices is you have the cost of the operating room, the cost of the physician, the cost of the device. So it could run forty or fifty thousand dollars compared mm -hmm. to an non-invasive device, which is a fraction of that. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do invasive if it's the best thing for the patient, but yeah. the more invasive treatments are a much less expensive option for many people. Yeah. Yeah, I see. And do you see any uh, is is do you see any evidence for non-invasive neuromodulation actually resulting in kind of plastic changes, which you know ultimately mean that perhaps the, the therapeutic doesn't need to be used, maybe at all, or or maybe doesn't need to be used so much? It's too early to tell. Part right. of that is the insurance companies at this point in time have not always found a reason not to allow them to be used. Right. And with those circumstances, we do not have a large enough population who are actually using it to give us enough real life experience. Right. I have right. people been using the devices for years and are still getting good relief. Right. And but still using it as much as they did at the beginning, as far as you're aware? Or? A lot of them because of the fact that these devices are both acute and preventative. Mm. The more they use it, the less attacks they have. Yeah, so I see. One paradigm, for example, the vagal nerve stimulator is used it every day for prevention and that as needed, and then after a period of time, the as needed goes down. Mm. So I, I think it's 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 the same thing that works to keep you from having an attack and to and to treat an attack. Yeah, and you and you mentioned that it, it tends to have a much better side effect profile. You know, there, were there any deleterious effects outside of the inconvenience of having to hold a device to your your head or your neck? I think there's a recent study with the vagal nerve stimulator and they were giving it to people that needed to be remain at work in the military mm. and by applying it, it made them more alert. So mm. that's one possible thing. The Cephali device, I understand if you take it and you have trouble sleeping, it'll put you to sleep. So there are beneficial side effects for the patient whether they want to stay up or go to sleep. Hmm. But any any deleterious ones, any problematic side effects that are perhaps not, not so terrible? With any of the non-invasive devices. It's kind of amazing, isn't it, that it doesn't you know cause arrhythmias or something? <laughs> well, that's extremely important because remember, with the vagal nerve stimulator, it's only at birth. It only goes into the brain. It's not from the brain vagus nerve to the heart. So therefore, you're not stimulating the vagal nerves that it check. That it yeah, but couldn't you, couldn't you have a kind of antidromic uh, yeah. stimulation or something? Antidromic. And the other point is there are the number of studies now ongoing to clearly show that if you monitor heart rate, you don't see anything. Really? That's it's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So so what do you think the, the big areas of, of, of sort of uh, innovation and, and growth are going to be in this? What's, what's going to be, what's the next kind of prize on the horizon? In, in this miniaturization mm -hmm. of the devices are there. But I think the most important point from a public health point of view is to let insurance companies or make insurance companies pay for these devices. If you think about it, we now have tablets for the treatment of migraine that mm -hmm. cost about $100 a pill. $100 yeah. a pill. And you can buy something like the Ceranica device for 12 treatments for that. I mean, they, they're, they're pill crazy. And the question really is they need to be able to give the right device to the right patient for the right reason. And yes. until that happens, we're not going to get anybody better. 
Well, that is a, a great note on which to finish. We're, we're doing our best to do something about that, uh, Professor uh, Stephen Silverstein. And thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, and yeah, we look forward to uh, following your progress in the future and, and, uh, and, and this exciting field. So thanks very much, Stephen. You're more than welcome. Thank you for having me.